It's day 243 of Heart Dive 365. I'm your Bible study friend, Kanoi. Welcome to the Heart Dive Podcast. We're hitting one of the longest chapters, actually, I think the longest chapter in the book of Ezekiel today, covering chapters 16 through 17, reading from the ESV by Crossway Translation. But welcome to Bible study. We are so glad that you are here. If you're studying with us in real time, happy whatever day it is. Every day is a good day. Every day has new mercies. Every day that the sun rises, it's another miracle, another chance for us to breathe in God's peace, His love, His joy. And so let us do that today, even if we're feeling a little under the weather, even if if we're feeling a little down in the dumps, we will choose joy anyway. And we'll do that by starting off by being grateful, you know, just grateful to be alive, grateful for whatever is around you, grateful for your friends and family. Let us know what you're grateful for. We haven't done a gratitude check in a while. Tell us in the comments three things that you are thankful for today. I think this will help to kind of lift the spirits of other people who might be feeling a little lackluster in life. If you are new to this Bible study, though, we welcome you here. We are the Heart Dive Ministry. Our heart is to be able to get people to dive into God's word heart first, to know him, to see his heartbeat, and to be able to bridge that gap between the theologian and the everyday churchgoer, the everyday believer. We know that it is in the word of God where we're going to be strengthened, where we are going to be lifted up, where we're going to be encouraged, but also where we're going to receive a little bit of correction that might not feel so good. But ultimately what that is doing is strengthening our relationship with Christ. And that's what we want to do. That's how we want to live. We want to be able to find our purpose. You're going to find it right here. We want to walk with boldness. You're going to be able to do that whenever you have this equipping you every single day. So let's go ahead and do that. We're going to start off by praying. That's how we always start our Bible studies, welcoming the Lord. I encourage you to comment along the way. If you have any questions, put those in the comments as well. We've got a wonderful community here. Oh, speaking of community, we've got an amazing Facebook group. I think we are now 17,000 members strong. Great team over there who is leading the charge. And we've got online groups that meet every single week. And so we encourage you to do that. If you're looking for a little bit of a deeper dive and some fellowship to be able to discuss the Word. So let's pray before we get into the Word. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. That's what we want to be, Lord, are just people who are grateful and thankful to you, our good Father, our good God, who is the giver of all good things. And so sometimes we get to a place where we kind of miss the goodness around us because of the chaos that is going on in the world, or maybe even some issues that we might have going on in our hearts or in our homes. And so bring us back, Lord to the pureness of just being a child of God and being in the best place we could possibly be in, which is right here at your feet. So as we open up your word today, will you do a work in us through it? This word is living. It is alive. It is active. And your spirit is breathing upon it. And so I pray that it will permeate into our hearts, into our spirits and souls, and it will sink down deep, take root, bear fruit, change things, shift things where necessary within us, Lord. If you've got to scrape some stuff out, we give you full permission to do that. We ask for your forgiveness right now for any of our sins, Lord. We repent, we turn away, we about face from the life we used to live and we devote ourselves to living for you. We want to turn toward you and always be walking on your path of righteousness. And so I pray that you will continue to guide us. Of course, the best leading is through your word. It is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. And so allow it to illuminate everything that we need to see today. Help us also to forgive others, Lord, because we know that that will dim our light a little bit. And so we want the most illumination possible. So help us to set people free, not hold on to any bitterness or anger. We pray against jealousy. We pray against cynicism. We pray against depression. We pray against fear, worry, anxiety, anything that might be trying to hold us back from the fullness of your joy. So thank you for that relief that you've given to us today, that true rest. We love you, Jesus, and we thank you for what you have done to give this to us. We pray these things in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. Okay, I do want to give you a bit of a warning that this chapter 16 is pretty passionate. I mean, there is some shocking language that Ezekiel uses, and I believe he did so with the intent to get the people's attention. But if you are on the younger end of the spectrum, if you've got children watching with you, I just wanted to be able to give you a heads up. So if you want to watch this one later, maybe skip over it, watch another video from last year, go do your devotions, or I don't know, whatever it takes. But a mature mind is definitely needed for this reading today. I think ESV has done a really good job at being tasteful in its wording, but the meaning behind it is pretty heavy. So 
Just wanted to say that. Let's start off here in chapter 16, verse 1. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, make known to Jerusalem her abominations. Now, I do want to point out that this word is being spoken to Jerusalem. I think somebody commented that they were a little confused as to who Ezekiel was preaching to. Most of the time, it was to the captives, the exiles in Babylon. But when the Lord told him to speak specifically to Jerusalem, to rise and go to Jerusalem, then he was speaking to the remnant that was still left in Jerusalem. Because remember, there were three different invasions of Babylon. So Jerusalem is not yet completely destroyed. Okay, so there's only been two invasions. And it was the second one where Ezekiel was taken captive too. So he tells him to say in the verse three, thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem, your origin and your birth are of the land of the Canaanites. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. Now, this is not literal. What he is saying here, this is not a compliment either. They were no better than the immoral Amorites and Hittites. The Amorites and the Hittites were among the people who lived in Canaan before Israel came in to take over it. He's basically saying, you guys are just like them. Their mother and father being depicted as Canaanites is saying they were offspring of this immorality. Verse four, and as for your birth, on the day that you were born, your cord was not cut nor were you washed with water to cleanse you, nor rubbed with salt, nor wrapped in swaddling cloths. I don't know if any of you stopped on rubbed with salt like I did. I was like, rubbed with salt? Why would they do that? I think this is actually meaning salt water. I don't think they took coarse salt and rubbed these brand new babies with it. But it was intended because salt was an antiseptic or used as one to make the skin firm, to clean them up, clean up the babies. So again, salt water. Verse five, no, I pitied you to do any of these things to you out of compassion for you, but you were cast out on the open field for you were aboard on the day that you were born. So he's reminding them of the state they once were in, their humble beginnings, their poor beginnings, and how he was the one who actually picked them up and had compassion on them and rescued them when they were tossed about and lost and vulnerable to attack. Verse six, and when I passed by you and saw you wallowing in your blood, I said to you in your blood, live. I said to you in your blood, live. I made you flourish like a plant on the field and you grew up and became tall and arrived at full adornment. Your breasts were formed and your hair had grown, yet you were naked and bare. So the breast being formed and the hair being grown in places that children do not have hair, this is speaking of the fact that they had matured physically, yet were still immature morally. So they still needed God. Verse eight, when I passed by you again and saw you, behold, you were at the age for love. And I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your nakedness. In a way, he is depicting that marriage covenant, likening it to the covenant that was made on Mount Sinai with Moses. I made my vow to you and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Lord God, and you became mine. So he, when he spread his garment over them, this is speaking of his protection over them. Then I bathed you with water and washed off your blood from you and anointed you with oil. I clothed you also with embroidered cloth and shod you with fine leather. I wrapped you in fine linen and covered you with silk. And silk, of course, was a very expensive fabric in this time. And I adorned you with ornaments and put bracelets on your wrists and a chain on your neck. And I put a ring in your nose and earrings in your ears and a beautiful crown on your head. Now, this ring on the nose would have depicted ownership. Remember, whenever they would put the all through the nose of the servant. Thus, you were adorned with gold and silver, and your clothing was of fine linen and silk and embroidered cloth. You ate fine flour and honey and oil, and you grew exceedingly beautiful and advanced to royalty. And your renown went forth among the nations because of your beauty, for it was perfect through the splendor that I had bestowed on you, declares the Lord God. So he's reminding them of his love and care that he had for them. And if you know Jesus, and if you know your word, even just a little bit, I hope that you recognize that we have all of this and more through our covenant that is made with Jesus. He does spread that garment over us. He gives us robes of righteousness. He clothes us. He covers our nakedness and shame. He enters into that covenant. He cleanses us, washes us clean. He anoints us. He wraps us up with purity. He adorns us with things that are much more valuable than gold and silver and ornaments and bracelets. 
We are his servant. He does put a crown on our head, calls us beautiful, advances us to royalty. We are the royal priesthood. So I hope you were able to see Jesus in all of that. Verse 15, but you trusted in your beauty and played the whore because of your renown and lavished your whorings on any passerby. Your beauty became his. So he is speaking of their apostasy here and the way that they walked away from him, much of the same way that an unfaithful spouse would walk away from their marriage. And the root of this, of course, all being pride. You took some of your garments and made for yourself colorful shrines and on them played the whore. The like has never been nor shall ever be. You also took your beautiful jewels of my gold and my silver, which I had given you and made for yourself images of men and with them played the whore. So they were essentially squandering the blessings and you took your embroidered garments to cover them and set my oil and my incense before them, these false gods. Also, my bread that I gave you, I fed you with the fine flour and oil and honey, yet you set before them for a pleasing aroma. And so it was, declares the Lord God. And you took your sons and your daughters, whom you had borne to me, and these you sacrificed to them to be devoured. Were your whoring so small a matter that you slaughtered my children and delivered them up as an offering by fire to them? So he is speaking of the fact that there was human and child sacrifice going on. And in all your abominations and your whorings, you did not remember the days of your youth when you were naked and bare, wallowing in your blood. And after all your wickedness, woe, woe to you. So this is God's sorrowful lament here, declares the Lord God. You built yourself a vaulted chamber and made yourself a lofty place in every square. At the head of every street, you built your lofty place and made your beauty an abomination, offering yourself to any passerby and multiplying your whoring. So he's depicting her basically as a prostitute and this offering yourself, you see this little footnote here, You also played the whore with the Egyptians, your lustful neighbors, multiplying your whoring to provoke me to anger. Behold, therefore, I stretched out my hand against you and diminished your allotted portion and delivered you to the greed of your enemies, the daughters of the Philistines who were ashamed of your lewd behavior. So imagine that, that the Philistines are even like, whoa, that's crazy. You played the whore also with the Assyrians. So they're making these political alliances here because you were not satisfied. Yes, you played the whore with them and still you were not satisfied. You multiplied your whoring also with the trading land of Chaldea or Babylon. And even with this, you were not satisfied. I didn't realize this, but now I understand why the Lord wanted us to start off with a heart of gratitude, why he prompted that in my spirit to say it, because that is where satisfaction will come from, is seeing the blessings that God has poured out in your life. I mean, the moment that you become ungrateful and you start searching every other place for that satisfaction, that's when you're going to end up in this position that Israel was in. How sick is your heart, declares the Lord God, because you did all these things, the deeds of a brazen prostitute, building your vaulted chamber at the head of every street and making your lofty place in every square. Oh, I forgot to mention these vaulted chambers and lofty places. I believe that the root word in Hebrew of one of these, I can't remember which one, is a word that sounds very similar to our word brothel, which makes sense because obviously that's in relation to prostitution. Yet you were not like a prostitute because you scorned payment. What? Adulterous wife who receives strangers instead of her husband. So this is like the worst of the worst. I mean, at least the prostitute got paid. He's saying you all aren't even getting paid. I mean, men give gifts to all prostitutes, but you gave your gifts to all your lovers, bribing them to come to you from every side with your whorings. So this is a picture of the prostitute out there begging for people to come to her. So you were different from other women in your whorings. No one solicited you to play the whore and you gave payment while no payment was given to you. Therefore, you were different. So it's not as if they were forced into this. They were doing it themselves. Now, if you are feeling disgusted, sick, if your back is hurting like mine is reading this, if you're feeling that gut-wrenching feeling in your stomach and in your esophagus, you're not alone, okay? I dread having to read these readings, but we've got to. I mean, God wrote it. I didn't write it. We need to acknowledge it for what it is. And I think that was the intention behind these words. He was trying to get the people's attention and he had to do it with this jolting language. Therefore, O prostitute, hear the word of the Lord. 
Thus says the Lord God, because your lust was poured out and your nakedness uncovered in your whorings with your lovers and with all your abominable idols and because of the blood of your children that you gave to them, therefore behold, I will gather all your lovers with whom you took pleasure, all those you loved and all those you hated. So this is implying that she would have a bunch of lovers, some she would love, some she would hate, which I would imagine would happen in any sort of scenario with multiple relationships. And just an example of the lovers that she loved, likely the Egyptians, Chaldeans, she hated. I will gather them against you from every side and will uncover your nakedness to them that they may see all your nakedness. And so the Lord is saying, I'm going to put you to shame, not just personal shame. It's going to be international shame as you will be humiliated in public. And I will judge you as women who commit adultery and shed blood And I will judge you as women who commit adultery and shed blood are judged and bring upon you the blood of wrath and jealousy. And I will give you into their hands and they shall throw down your vaulted chamber and break down your lofty places. They shall strip you of your clothes and take your beautiful jewels and leave you naked and bare. They shall bring up a crowd against you and they shall stone you and cut you to pieces with their swords. And they shall burn your houses and execute judgments upon you in the sight of many women. I will make you stop playing the whore and you shall also give payment no more. So here we are seeing a pronouncement of his divine and complete judgment upon them. And when he says he's going to make them stop playing the whore, this is true. I mean, they're going to go into exile and they're not going to have this problem of idolatry that they had before. Verse 42, so I will satisfy my wrath on you and my jealousy shall depart from you. So it's not going to last forever. I will be calm and will no more be angry because you have not remembered the days of your youth, which of course these days of their youth led to their self-destructive pride, but have enraged me with all these things. Therefore, behold, I have returned your deeds upon your head, declares the Lord God. Have you not committed lewdness in addition to all your abominations? Behold, everyone who uses Proverbs will use this proverb about you, like mother, like daughter, and not in a good way. You are the daughter of your mother who loathed her husband and her children, and you are the sister of your sisters who loathed their husbands and their children. Your mother was a Hittite and your father an Amorite, and your elder sister is Samaria, which Samaria, remember, was the capital of Israel who should have served as an example for them, but they acted just like their older sister, who lived with her daughters to the north of you. And your younger sister who lived to the south of you is Sodom with her daughters. So even though he called them to be different, they are acting just like their neighbors. Not only did you walk in their ways and do according to their abominations, within a very little time, you were more corrupt than they in all your ways. As I live, declares the Lord God, your sister Sodom and her daughters have not done as you and your daughters have done. This is a pretty heavy word of rebuke being spoken here because Sodom was infamous for their corruption and their immorality. And it's interesting here because watch how they explain the sins of Sodom here in verse 49. Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, excess of food and prosperous ease, but did not aid the poor and the needy. Now, this is not what is highlighted in Genesis whenever we see the destruction of Sodom. And some people have used this verse to try to negate or excuse the immoral or sexual sin in Sodom because it doesn't say it here, but this was actually just in addition to that sin. So it doesn't excuse it. And so you can imagine whenever it says that she had pride and excess of food and prosperous ease, it was like she was eating, drinking, and being merry. You know, they were living a life of luxury. They had all the entertainment. They had their own Hollywood, probably. Very self-reliant and selfish. They were haughty and did an abomination before me. So I removed them when I saw it. Samaria has not committed half your sins. You have committed more abominations than they and have made your sisters appear righteous by all the abominations that you have committed. Now, how did this happen? Well, one, we got to remember that Samaria had fallen 130 years prior. And so they obviously had more time to sin. But not only that, their sin was even more grievous because of the fact that they were the center of worship. They had the temple there. They had Israel as an example or the Northern Kingdom as an example, and yet they still fell. 
So that's why they're considered worse off. Bear your disgrace, you also, for your sins, in which you acted more abominably than they. They are more in the right than you. So be ashamed, you also, and bear your disgrace, for you have made your sisters appear righteous. Verse 53, I will restore their fortunes, both the fortunes of Sodom and her daughters and the fortunes of Samaria and her daughters. And I will restore your own fortunes in their midst that you may bear your disgrace and be ashamed of all that you have done, becoming a consolation to them. So here we see how wide and deep God's love is that he is going to restore Sodom as well. We saw some of that restoration take place for Israel, but the ultimate restoration, of course, being in the millennial age. And I kind of wonder about Sodom. I didn't really think to dig deeper into that. So if you've got any insight or some thought as to the restoration of Sodom, what might that possibly be or look like? Like, I want to circle that and try to remember to look at that later. As for your sisters, verse 55, Sodom and her daughter shall return to their former state, and Samaria and her daughter shall return to their former state, and you and your daughter shall return to your former state. Was not your sister Sodom a byword in your mouth in the day of your pride, before your wickedness was uncovered? Now you have become an object of reproach for the daughters of Syria and all of those around her, and for the daughters of the Philistines, those all around who despise you." You bear the penalty of your lewdness and your abominations, declares the Lord. And thank God he ends this very depressing chapter with a word of hope here in verse 59. For thus says the Lord God, I will deal with you as you have done. You have despised the oath in breaking the covenant, yet I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth, and I will establish for you an everlasting covenant." Then you will remember your ways and be ashamed when you take your sisters, both your elder and your younger, and I give them to you as daughters, but not on account of the covenant with you. I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall know that I am the Lord, that you may remember and be confounded and never open your mouth again because of your shame, when I atone for you for all that you have done, declares the Lord God. And of course, with this mention of atonement, this is pointing to the everlasting covenant as made through the Messiah by Jesus. So no one is beyond forgiveness. There is nothing that we can do that is too great for him not to cover us with that grace, with that love, with that forgiveness and mercy. And that promise remains today, you know? So if there is something that you think you have done that was too bad for him to be able to forgive you or make you whole or cleanse you from, that is a lie. This is a promise. And that forgiveness is immediate. We just have to be the ones to be willing to receive it. And now here in chapter 17, we see a parable of two eagles and a vine. Verse one, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, propound a riddle and speak a parable to the house of Israel. So a riddle typically intended to be spoken with a little bit of wit, perhaps. And of course, there's some difficulty in understanding it initially, but once it's explained, there is a deeper meaning and then it makes sense. And then of course, a parable was usually an illustration of some sort that had a story or allegorical aspect to it that would help to commit the meaning to memory. And so it's usually shown in some sort of comparison. And so that's what we're going to take a look at here. Verse three, Say, thus says the Lord God, a great eagle with great wings and long pinions, rich in plumage of many colors. Is it plumage or plumage? Rich in plumage? Plumage. I don't know. Of many colors. Came to Lebanon and took the top of the cedar. Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and give you the meaning right now. The eagle represents the king of Babylon or Nebuchadnezzar. So this is the eagle with great wings comes to Lebanon, which is intended to mean Israel or Canaan or Jerusalem, took the top of the cedar. This is the king of Jerusalem, which is at this time Zedekiah. He broke off the topmost of its young twigs and carried it to a land of trade and set it in a city of merchants. So Babylon comes to Israel, to the king of Zedekiah, breaks off the topmost of its young twigs, meaning his sons, and carried it to this land of trade, which is Babylon. And then in verse five, then he took of the seed of the land and planted it in fertile soil. 
So he brought it to the place where the royal offspring will rule. He placed it beside the abundant waters. He set it like a willow twig, and it sprouted and became a low-spreading vine, and its branches turned toward him, and its roots remained where it stood. So it became a vine and produced branches and put out boughs. Okay, so everybody got that first image. Here's the second one. There was another great eagle. This one implying the king of Egypt, the Pharaoh, with great wings and much plumage. And behold, this vine bent its roots toward him and shot forth its branches toward him from the bed where it was planted that he might water it. So notice that this eagle is a little more passive, like it's not going and taking the twig and doing this and doing that. It's just kind of there. And the vine is kind of desperately turning toward it, hoping that this eagle would protect it. And so this is speaking of the remnant in Judah that turns to Egypt for help. It had been planted on good soil by abundant waters that it might produce branches and bear fruit and become a noble vine. Say, thus says the Lord God, will it thrive? This is a rhetorical question. Answer, no. Will he not pull up its roots and cut off its fruit so that it withers, so that all its fresh sprouting leaves wither? It will not take a strong arm or many people to pull it from its roots. Behold, it is planted. Will it thrive? Will it not utterly wither when the east wind strikes it? Wither away on the bed where it sprouted. Now, at this point in hearing this, if the people understood it, they're probably thinking, man, he's being a little unfair here. But here in verse 11, then the word of the Lord came to me, say now or explain to the rebellious house. Do you not know what these things mean? Tell them, behold, the king of Babylon came to Jerusalem and took her king and her princes and brought them to him to Babylon. And he took one of the royal offspring and made a covenant with him, putting him under oath, the chief men of the land he had taken away, which included the king and others, including Daniel and his friends, that the kingdom might be humble and not lift itself up and keep his covenant that it might stand. But he rebelled against him by sending his ambassadors to Egypt, that they might give him horses and a large army. Will he thrive? Can one escape who does such things? Can he break the covenant and yet escape? So he's like, seriously, you think that you're going to be able to turn to Egypt, the second eagle, and get help from them? No. As I live, verse 16 declares the Lord God, surely in the place where the king dwells, who made him king, whose oath he despised, and whose covenant with him he broke, in Babylon he shall die. Now, I don't know if you remember this, but remember when Jeremiah and even Ezekiel was saying, hey guys, just submit to Babylon. But in breaking that oath, they are ultimately breaking an oath with the Lord as well. Oaths were serious business. They still are. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Pharaoh with his mighty army and great company will not help him in war. When mounds are cast up and siege walls built to cut off many lives, he despised the oath in breaking the covenant. And behold, he gave his hand and did all these things. He shall not escape. So their fate is sealed. There's no escaping this. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, as I live, Surely it is my oath that he despised and my covenant that he broke. I will return it upon his head. I will spread my net over him. And this is not a net of comfort or protection. This is an actual capturing them so that they cannot escape. And he shall be taken in my snare and I will bring him to Babylon and enter into judgment with him there for the treachery he has committed against me. And all the pick of his troops shall fall by the sword. So here we are seeing a vision of this final destruction and the survivors shall be scattered to every wind and you shall know that I am the Lord and I have spoken. So again, the Lord declaring his judgment based upon their sin of breaking this oath with Nebuchadnezzar and ultimately with God himself. Now the Lord has been so clear, you know, throughout the entire Old Testament that keeping your word is of the utmost importance. I mean, it doesn't even matter how they made an oath, they were to keep it. And we're still called to keep our word today. You know, whether we say that we're going to do something for someone or we make an agreement, we get married or anything that that we pledge in obligation or responsibility to, God still expects us to fulfill that word. This one will speak strongly to the yes people out there. I'm one of them. You know, whenever you just say yes to everything, heart check. Is there something you said you would do that you have not been faithful to complete? I've gotten better though. I'm much better at saying no nowadays. I had to learn that the hard way. Verse 22, thus says the Lord God, I myself will take a sprig from the lofty top of the cedar and will set it out 
So here he's showing his divine intervention. I will break off from the topmost of its young twigs, a tender one, and I myself will plant it on a high and lofty mountain. This high and lofty mountain being Mount Zion, the tender one, we see kind of like a new name of Jesus, the Messiah. He is that twig. On the mountain height of Israel, will I plant it that it may bear branches and produce fruit and become a noble cedar. This being representation of the Davidic monarchy and the rule of Jesus as the branch of David. And under it will dwell every kind of bird. This speaking of other nations that will be under the rule of Israel one day. And all the trees of the field shall know that I am the Lord. I bring low the high tree and make high the low tree, dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will do it. So in this picture, he is showing his sovereignty that he's the one in control. There's no use trying to buck up against him or do things differently or try to seek shelter, protection, hope anywhere else, but in him alone. And as crazy as it may sound or seem today, Israel is one day going to be the world power. They are going to rule. Every other nation will be submissive to it with Jesus as its ruler when he comes back in his second coming. This is not just fairy tale, guys. This is real stuff. This is truth. This is the only book. This is the only religion. The only words that have been spoken where all of these prophecies have been fulfilled and some of them yet to be fulfilled. This is how we know that we can stand on that truth because of that fulfillment. And that's exciting. I mean, this is good news for us to be able to see these things having been partially fulfilled still yet to come. It gives us hope, especially in such a dark time in history. And if you've been watching the news, some of the things that are looming in the Middle East. So let's take a look at some of our deep dive questions. How does this allegory of Jerusalem and God's care for it relate to our lives personally? What similarities are seen between the sins of Sodom, Samaria, Jerusalem, and our nations today? What does spiritual adultery look like for us? How do we recognize its potential and how do we avoid it? What is the eternal covenant and how does it apply to your life? How important is loyalty to God and loyalty to others? What other examples are there of the vine in the Bible, and how does this story compare or contrast? So, Heavenly Father, your love is relentless. You are not done with us yet. You're not done with Israel. And no matter how far one may stray, you still call them by name and desire for their return. We're so grateful that we heard the call and that we are never out of reach of your grace and your mercy. We recognize today our own humble and poor beginnings. Even if some of us were born into wealth, we were all spiritually dead and in need of revival. You told our dead bones to live and you granted us life by the power of your blood. You raised us from a lowly state to a place of great glory as your bride. You made us flourish like a plant in the field and matured us to our full adornment. And even when we have fallen again, you pick us back up and you cover us with your grace and love. And when others tossed us aside, God, you wrapped us up with compassion. When we were rejected, you accepted us as we were with every flaw and every fault. And you gave us new clothing of righteousness. We are so grateful for this beautiful eternal covenant that you have made with us. Jesus, thank you for loving us enough to freely offer yourself without fault as the perfect sacrifice. There is no greater love than that. And now we have a crown on our heads and we've been advanced to royalty. We may not ever feel it in this lifetime, but we will choose to believe that your word that has been spoken is true. And I pray that we never take any of this for granted. May we never receive these blessings in vain or squander them. I pray that wealth, success, entertainment, laziness, comfort, or anything else will never take precedence over you in our lives. May you always be front and center of our devotion and worship. We want to remain faithful to the covenant and faithful to you in every way. So we will start by simply being grateful for who you are and what you have done. We are grateful for every blessing, big and small. So may we be a people who honor our covenant with both you and people. 
When we honor our word, we are honoring you. And if we fail to keep it, we dishonor you. So I pray we will not just be yes people. Give us the courage to say no where necessary so that we can be confident in our yes. And we humbly ask for your grace to extend to our entire nation and throughout the world. Forgive us where we have strayed from the virtue that established this great place. Bring us back to your word. I pray that prayer and faith will be allowed and established once again in our schools, in our workplaces, and in our government. Yes, we believe in freedom and in choice because that is what you desire for us, but your holiness is above all. And so we desire for all to return to righteousness. Please hear our prayer and heal our land. You are still sovereign and we know and we believe that no matter how withered we may become, your redemptive power is greater than all and you can breathe new life into anything. So let it be with our people. We love you and we praise you and give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Heaven and salvation is a divine gift that is given to us by grace. None of us deserve it. In fact, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death and every single one of us have fallen short. And then we desperately need someone to pay that price. And Jesus did it. He didn't do it because we are righteous on our own merit. He did it because he loves us and he wants to spend eternity with us. But it won't happen if we don't receive him before we leave this earth as Lord and Savior. Hell is a very real thing, and there is no second chance after we take our last breath here. So I want to be able to give someone the opportunity today who is saying, I'm ready. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm going to end up after I die. But I don't want to live another day without knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt where I am going to end up. I see now that this is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're gonna say a prayer and I'm gonna put the words on the screen so that you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that he died and rose again, then you will be saved. So we're gonna say this prayer together. Believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. I confess my sins to you today, and I turn from them, and I now live my life for you. I know that I am forgiven of all my sins, so I receive you now as Lord and Savior, and I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.